Jerome uh, was the uh, uh, a famous painter. Uh, he was really, he was a, he was a, uh, a, a Good morning, Health Masters. My name is Jonna Jacobs. For any guests that are in the room, I'll open up today's meeting. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. Thank you very much. And without delay, I'll ask Dr. Nagunde to come and join us. He'll be serving as our Toastmaster for today. Please welcome Dr. Nagunde, Toastmaster Nagunde. Thank you, baby. Thank you. Good day. Um, if you would allow me, let us just bow our heads for all our friends and a tragedy for one minute in Las Vegas. Thank you. I, came, I started coming out here this morning feeling very great, but we'll keep feeling great. This is October 1st, so it's a good month, and we have a strong team today, very strong team. The field is full. Uh, it's my pleasure, it's my pleasure to introduce our grammarian for the day, Ms. Toastmaster Victoria Russell. Toastma Toastmaster Minute, Ms. Camille Wilder. Houston. All right. <laughs> our first speaker today will be our own David Brondy, and he'll be followed by Miss Lucy to Toastmaster Lucy Tobin, and uh, to close out the team would be a uh, distinguished Toastmaster Bill, Miss Victoria. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So the word of the day is initiative. Today I celebrate my one year anniversary with the, with the agency today. So before I began, I always say I was gonna take initiative and embark on my new ventures. So initiative means to, the ability to assess and initiate things independently. Use your initiative, imagination, and common sense. The power, opportunity to act, or take charge before others do. 
Initiative is all about taking charge. An initiative is the first in a series of actions. Initiatives can also mean a personal quality that shows a willingness to get things done and take responsibility. So I encourage you all today to take initiative. That is the word of the day. Thank you for taking a great initiative. Thank you. Thank you for a great initiative. Yes, it's always great to take initiatives because uh, that's how we progress. At this moment, I want to bring up Toastmaster Camille Wilder. She's our Toastmaster. Good afternoon, fellow Toastmasters. I decided to... Uh, look on the Toastmasters website to come up with some ideas for the Toastmaster Minute today and they have a section called 90 Tips for Toastmasters from Toastmasters and so I lumped a few into how to prepare for a speech so that I can get ready for my next speech and maybe it'll help someone else too. Uh, one of the first items listed was know your material. So talk about a topic that you're interested in and that you know a lot about. Reinforce your message with facts and statistics, if possible. The second point is to make it personal. So use humor, personal experience, anecdotes, conversational language to make your speech engaging. Another point that I liked was to time yourself. So when you're <laughs> practicing, time yourself so that you can stay within the time limits, limits, not just when you come up to the platform, but time yourself when you're practicing. Another good one for me was to relax. Take a deep breath. Um, I'd be so nervous when you approach the podium, so I definitely need to do that. And then the last one I liked was visualize your success. So think about giving a good speech and your performance and not so much worrying about if I mess up or like that. So that's your Toastmasters Minutes tips on how to prepare for a speech. Visualize your success. What an initiative to follow. There's a definite process in keeping your audience on the edge of their seats. It's probably something you haven't had or seen many people or other speakers use. However, once you master it, you'll find doors opening to you that you never even knew existed. Our next speaker learned this process from the great Craig Valentine. Wow. I've also tested that video, and it's uh, very juicy. His speech is titled, Well Begun is Half Done. Well Begun is Half Done. So let me bring up Toastmaster, none other than David. Oh. <laughs> David. So You're welcome. Do you know what the tool is that you can use to keep your audience on the edge of their seat before you begin your speech? Any guesses? Pause. It's true. Another tool is your introduction. Think about your introduction. Unfortunately, as Craig Valentine says, so many speakers have introductions that are absolutely worthless to their audience. But instead, you can have your introduction in such a way that the audience is fired up and cannot wait to hear what you have to say. Now, I'd like you to do something right now. I'd like you to close your eyes and imagine hearing this as my introduction for this speech. Imagine this. Our next speaker is the section chief of stroke and heart attack at the Arkansas Department of Health. He was also named Employee of the Month for August 2017. 
In addition, our speaker is absolutely oblivious to the fact that we could care less about those things, and we are much more interested in what we are going to get out of the speech. Moreover, our speaker seems to have no idea that we are simply hoping for his useless autobiographical information to end so we can start clapping as if we're interested. Finally, he doesn't realize we're beginning to say to ourselves, wow, since his entire introduction is about him, I bet his entire speech is about him also. Why did I even come to Toastmasters today? So with that said, please help me welcome to the stage the person who would have the least effective introduction in history if it were not for the other thousands of presenters with introductions just like his. Please help me welcome the section chief of stroke and heart attack, a person who is sure to be worthless to you over the next seven minutes, David Rodney. Now, do you get the point? Have you ever heard introduction like that? Have you ever used introduction like that? I kind of have. I'll admit. Craig Valentine says that of all the speakers he sees every year, he watches hundreds. He won the world title in 1999, the best speaker in the world. 95% of the speakers have these biographies of brilliance all about them but it digs a hole for the speaker that he or she is trying to climb out of the whole speech is your introduction about the audience or is it about you think about that think about that what should our introductions do in a nutshell it should get the audience to be wanting more information they should want to know what comes next. Do you have a pen? If you have a pen or a pencil, I'd like you to write down something. I think Jerry doesn't have a pencil right now or a pen. Let's get Jerry a pen. But I want you to write down a very important concept as part of your introduction. T's. Write down the word T's. T-E-A-S-E. -E. Because your T starts with your introduction. And you want to have your introduction in such a way that your audience will say three words. Can you guess what those three words are? You want your audience to say three words to themselves after hearing your introduction. Three words. What do you think, Jerry? What are the three words? I can't wait. I can't wait. That's perfect. <laughs> I can't wait or just as good, tell me more. I can't wait or tell me more. Tell me more is only two words. Well, that's three. Well, but either one, you want the audience to hunger. You want them, right? Don't we want the people to hunger what comes next? Or do we want people to say, so what? Which is better, so what or tell me more? Tell me more. I can't wait. Now, Craig Valentine teaches a lot of techniques. He calls them the killer introduction techniques. We don't have time to cover them all. We'll cover one. And if you use this, you open doors that you never even knew existed. Remember this technique. Killer introduction technique one, number one. When you do an introduction, make the first sentence about them. Make the first sentence about them. The very first sentence of your introduction sets the tone for your whole speech. It's critical the audience thinks it's all about them, not about you. For example, think about this introduction versus the one you heard a few minutes ago. <coughs> there is a definite process for keeping your audience on the edge of their seats. It's not easy to come by. It's not easy to use. However, when you master it, it'll open doors for you you never even knew existed. You see, there's a little bit of a difference. The first sentence was about the audience. And who is that speech about? Is it about the speaker or about the audience? It's about the audience. Because you want to get the audience to say, I can't wait. I can't wait to know this information because don't I want to keep the audience on the edge of the seat? Don't I want to do that? Tell me more. I can't wait. And when you think about it, a lot of times when we speak, we're trying to sell a result. We're actually trying to sell a process. <laughs> We're trying to sell a certain process. But in order to get the audience interested in the process, they have to first understand the result. What is the result 
So I'm curious about what the process is. We want people to be curious about the process. Curiosity. We want to tease them. Tease them and curiosity. But the key is to sell it first. So I invite you that the next time you're preparing an introduction for this club and you're thinking about it and you're working on it, I want you to think about something. Think about making the first sentence in your introduction about the audience. It'll open doors for you you never even knew existed. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you. What a great initiative to teach us something that we know. Let me take this opportunity to bring up our next speaker. Would you visualize art and public health? I'm so ready to hear. Welcome, Toastmaster Toby. Thank you. So the right button here. Okay, so um, I have an art background. Uh, that was what my college degree was, and then I went to graduate school and made my way to working at the health department for many years now. And it's always been something that art has always been something that I've felt was important in my life, but it's taken me many years to really understand how it applies to so many things and it's not just something nice those with lots of money can have or those who are just more crafty than others and I'm curious how many of you maybe not right now but in general like to do some sort of art or craft okay that's quite a lot so this is um, a definition by WHO which I'm not going to read because it's kind of wordy, but it's basically saying that people should be, you know, taken in a holistic context and uh, not just seen as a, there's the causative agent or the pathogen, but that health is, is to be taken holistically. And we have a lot of research actually in how art has an effect on health. And I am going to use a summary that was taken, you know, kind of a survey of all the research that was in the American Journal of Public Health. And there's not enough time to cover all of the arts, but there is a lot of research, too, into music, dance, theater arts, and creative writing. If you're interested, take some initiative and um, use it. Look, look into this yourself if, if one of these is what you're more interested in. I'm going to cover visual arts. So there's a lot, of, um, a lot of research having to do with cancer and the visual arts. And this example talks about the uh, people who, like if you divide them, you know, always there's the, the control group that didn't get the art intervention. So the um, positive effect on the people who had various types of visual arts, it improved their life experiences and their, their, they were less preoccupied with their cancer. Their thoughts were not just on, I have cancer. They had more positive thoughts, it enhanced their self-worth and identity, enabled them to maintain a social identity, not just about their cancer and to express their feelings in a symbolic manner, especially during chem chemotherapy. Another study had significant decreases in the symptoms of physical and emotional distress during treatment. And then one that was specific to breast cancer patients who participated in art history, in art therapies, uh, it enhanced their level of psychological well-being and it decreased their negative emotions and enhance the positive ones. Then this one was um, surprising to me because this was just one hour of art therapy session with cancer inpatients and they reported a significant reduction in eight out of nine of the symptoms measured by the Edmund scale and that measures pain, tiredness, nausea, depression, anxiety, drowsiness, well-being, shortness of breath, and appetite. There's a study on, uh, with dialysis patients. At one group had six months of art intervention, 
and they had a lot of improvement in s the scores this time they used this SF 36 which I had to look up but it's it's both physical and emotional symptoms and it's used to assess how patients are doing and it said they had uh, their weight gain serum dioxide content phosphate levels less depression so there were both physical and emotional uh, improvements in the patients that had the the art intervention and also better social functioning and less body pain that's I mean that's pretty impressive to me then they, they've done some studies on hospital stays like the group that had art therapy had better vital signs diminished cortisol related to stress and even needed less medication to sleep and this one is pretty amazing to me because I have noticed this in hospital rooms. There is usually a painting and it is usually a landscape. So maybe that they've at least read enough to know that that's a good thing or they just have a nice interior decorator. But the, the, the rooms with patients in it that had a landscape painting on the wall had decreased need for narcotic pain medication and left the hospital earlier compared to people who didn't have that. And then they've also done some research with caregivers of family members who have cancer. And for them, it reduced their stress, reduced their anxiety level, decreased their uh, anxiety, increased the positive emotions, and increased their positive communication with their patient and with the, the health care providers. So this is uh, <coughs> pretty impressive to me that there's so many, they've studied so many different illnesses that are pretty serious and that the, the effects can be so dramatic. There were some limitations in the studies, but the overall conclusion of this report was that it can, can, art can contribute to many aspects of both physiological and psychological well-being. And it does not contradict or, but it complements the biomedical view of treating patients. It also uh, helps people, I like this description, it said through creative expression we find our identity and our reservoir of healing. And there's no side effects. I mean, that's a big one. So I want to just give you this thought that I've read some about in the past, but in this context, I thought it was useful to think about too. All children are artists. They sing to themselves. They sing with their parents. They sing in school. <coughs> they dance spontaneously. They do art. They all love to do painting and visual arts. And why do we stop? this just a thought to leave you with because it's good for you thank you Lucy yes art can initiate and elicit positive outcomes in our health let me take this moment to bring up none other than our distinguished Toastmaster Miss Biddle our topic is the death penalty. Thank you. I am coming from the Speaking to an Informed Manual, an abstract concept. I will be talking about the death penalty. And we all know the death penalty is a controversial issue. Capital punishment is legal in the majority of U.S. states, including in two states, California and Nebraska, where voters decided to retain it in the 2016 election. The death penalty has been back in the news recently as Arkansas carried out its first execution since 2005. One of eight inmates the state originally planned to put on death, put to death over the course of 11 days this month. Courts have since intervened and temporarily halted 
some of the executions. As the, death, the debate over the death penalty continues in the U.S. and worldwide, here are five facts I want you to think about. The annual number of U.S. executions peaked at 98 in 1999 and has fallen sharply in the years since. For the first time in a decade, U.S. was not among the top five countries in executions in 2016. The U.S. ranked seven internationally behind China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Pakistan, and Egypt. Support for the death penalty in the U.S. has fallen dramatically in the past two decades, but more Americans still favor than oppose it. American harbors doubts about how the death penalty is applied and whether it deters serious crime. In a Pew Research study survey from 2005, about 6 in 10 adults said the death penalty does not deter people from committing serious crime. There are racial and gender divides in opinions on the death penalty in the U.S. A majority of whites, 57%, favor the death penalty, compared with 29% of blacks and 36% of Hispanics. And also, men are more likely than women to favor capital punishment, 55% versus 43%. Now, what are the financial costs? The best cost for death penalty trials in Kansas averaged about $400,000 per case to pre compare to $100,000 per case when the death penalty was not so. A new study in California revealed that the cost of the death penalty in the state has been over $4 billion since 1978. In Maryland, an average death penalty case resulting in a death sentence cost approximately $3 million. Enforcing the death penalty cost Florida $51 million a year above what it would cost to punish all first-degree murders with life in prison without parole. The most comprehensive study in the country found that the death penalty cost North Carolina $2.16 million per execution over the cost of sentencing murderers to life in prison. In Texas, a death penalty case costs an average of $2.3 million, about three times the cost of imprisoning someone in a single cell at the high security level for 40 years. Now I'm going to go to something else. What does the scripture say about the death penalty? There are three side, well, three avenues for this issue. What does the scripture mandate, prohibit, or permit about capital punishment? Christians tend to take one of these three positions. Scripture mandates capital punishment first. There are three arguments. Genesis 9 and 6 says, Whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. The absolute language of Genesis suggests that all those who kill another human being must be killed. Argument number two. The law as given to Moses on Mount Sinai ordained execution for several offenses, including murder, but not accidental killing. Then argument number three. In Romans 13, 1 through 7, Paul calls his readers to submit to the authority of civil government, reminding him that if you do wrong, be afraid, for he, the authority, does not bear the sword for nothing. In its ultimate use, the word sword implies execution. Now, second thought, scripture prohibits capital punishment. Old Testament law clearly calls for capital punishment for those who believe that scripture prohibits capital punishment. Argument number one, Israel was a theocracy, a nation ruled directly by God. Therefore, its law was unique. Executing false teachers and those who sacrificed to false gods are examples of provisions that sprang from Israel's unique position as a nation of God called to be holy. When Israel ceased to exist as a nation, its law was nullified. Argument number two. 
Christ's death on the cross ended the requirement for blood recompense and blood sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God, replaced the sacrifice of animals. His death also made it unnecessary to execute murderers to maintain human dignity and value because the crucifixion forever established human value. And then argument number three. Christ's teaching emphasizes forgiveness and willingness to suffer evil rather than resist it by force. This may not be definitive on the issue of the state's authority to execute, but it does demonstrate a different approach to responding to evil than that established on Mount Sinai. And then thirdly, Scripture permits capital punishment. Those who argue that the Bible permits capital punishment see strengths in both the pro and con arguments, but disagree with conclusions of both. In argument number one, as noted previously, Scripture includes many provisions for capital punishment. The Mosaic Law significantly limited the scope of Genesis 9 and 6. For example, individuals guilty of manslaughter or ac accidentally caused another's death were exempted from the death penalty. Argument number two, Perhaps the most compelling arguments against capital punishment are the example of capital criminals who were not executed, such as Cain, Moses, and David. And not only did Jesus refuse to condemn the woman caught in adultery, but he also suggested that only those without sin were qualified to perform the execution. And then argument number three. New Testament pastors assume the existence of the death penalty, but don't take a position one way or the other. Romans 13 comes closest to the speaking of a state's authority to execute, but significantly it refers to the state's authority, not obligation to execute. This is consistent with the position that states are permitted, not mandated, or prohibited the use of this sanction. So, what do we come down to? The Mosaic Laws procedure says that there are serious, their extreme sanction of death should be considered only in the most serious offenses. The certainty of guilt. Before a murder could be executed, two witnesses had to confirm his gift. The intent. Numbers 35, 22 to 24 established a capital punishment could not be imposed when the offender did not act intentionally. Due process, several provisions of the law ensured that executions took place only after appropriate judicial procedures. And then reluctance to execute. Although the law, the law may sound bloodthirsty, it was applied with great restraint. In Ezekiel 33 and 11, God laments, As sure as I live, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. The lawgiver himself was reluctant to impose the death penalty, preferring that the wrongdoers repent. Reluctance is not refusal, but it does imply that execution should be a last result. I'm not telling you one way or the other what your idea should be. I'm just giving you some ideas to think about when it comes to the death penalty. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you excessively. <laughs> wow. Wow. Forgiveness. Let us give an extra round of applause for our strong field. At this time, I'll bring none other than uh, our vice president, our general evaluator, Miss Jane. Thank you. Very nice speeches today. I was impressed by the initiative in the amount of research that was done. I'd like to bring up our evaluation team. Evaluating David Vrundy will be Toastmaster Leonard Mukasa. Thank you very much, Toastmaster Jana. What an initiative.
that Mukasa should stand up here and evaluate his mentor, David Brudney. What can I say? Do you know how to keep an audience at the edge of their seat? That was the introduction. I've known Dave for a while. That's how he does it. You, he's saying, give me more. Tell me more about this. I mean, it's a constant. So we, he's hit the first part of a speech introduction, and I would say it was a sandwich. Started with a bang, gave us some action. We thought about it. We acted it out. We learned something, and then we laughed for sure, and then he closed it again, saying, give me more. And he quoted somebody. The speech says you should quote somebody. He did quote Craig Valentine, somebody I know very well. I'm on the 27th tip of his 52 tips, I imagine. What could he have done more to improve this speech? How do we get introduction strengthened? I'm not sure I know how we could have done it better. Maybe to walk me through the stages, steps. How do we get, to, how do we perfect this introduction speech? And make it universal because all speeches come different. Give us examples, whether it's a story, whether it's uh, music, whether it's a poem, a dialogue we've had from uh, Toastmaster Phipps in the past, quoting Shakespeare, how do you weave all this into an impactful, an impact, impactful introduction? Dev, I always want more from you. Thank you very much. That's my side, Jana. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mikasa. We skipped table topics today since to distinguished Toastmaster Adrian Duncan is not with us. Does anybody know where he is today? Did anybody get an email from him? Okay. Moving on then to our second evaluation. Shauna Meadows will be evaluating Lucy Tobin's speech on art in public health. Help me welcome Shauna Meadows. Thank you. Good afternoon, fellow Toastmasters. Good afternoon, Toastmaster Lucy. I really, really enjoyed your speech, Art, of art in Public Health. I loved the topic. When I heard the title, I was expecting it to be something about showing how logos or showing, um, excuse me, showing the art visually from, from your perspective. I didn't expect it to be about how it was therapeutic for people. It just really was a wonderful topic, very interesting. I like how you gave the examples of how it would help patients with uh, dialysis and the patients with, uh, with depression and anxiety. And I like how you started your introduction that you connected it with the things that apply so much to, to art. Uh, I could say f from personal experience, I really can't think of much more therapeutic thing to do than, I don't know if anyone else has ever gone to the, like the sip and wine art, where you do the sip some wine and do the art. I just really enjoy those sessions, and so it made me, listening to your speech made me want to take initiative and 
get in another class like that. Uh, I really liked the way that you closed your speech as well, that you gave the conclusion on how it contributes to physically and psychologically helping patients. I just agree totally. My mother is currently ill, and I just keep thinking that she would pick up the crochet needle or or do some type of sewing that it would really help her, you know, psychologically and just lift her spirits. And I like also how you related it to children and how children just naturally know to to do art or music as therapy. It just comes natural for them. So thank you for your speech. And the only thing I would say you could work on a little is giving more eye contact to the audience and just practicing so that you're more comfortable with crutch words and things like that. Other than that, I think you did a great job. Thank you, Postmaster Meadows. Thank you. Our last speech evaluator today will be Philip Borden, who will be evaluating distinguished Toastmaster Joyce Biddle on her death penalty speech. Thank you, Toastmaster. Thank you. Good afternoon, fellow Toastmasters, guests, especially Joyce. A very interesting speech. This was the, the abstract concept speech from the Speaking to Inform manual. I've done that speech before. I think we've had a couple of others in this club. If you weren't familiar with that speech before you came into today's meeting, Joyce's speech is a perfect example of that. It's not a speech to persuade. It's a speech to inform, to do the research, to present it in a logical fashion, and to take on a difficult concept and an abstract concept that might be difficult to put your arm around. I thought you did a good job with that. In spite of the fact that I knew that it wasn't a persuasive speech, that it was a speech to inform, I kept finding myself thinking, I wonder where she's going with this. Where is this? Where are these biblical passages leading to? What will the conclusion be? And I kept reminding myself, it's a speech to inform. It's not a speech to persuade. That makes it that much more difficult. You, you can't get up and say, today I'm going to try to convince you of X and spend the next seven minutes doing that and hope you arrive at the right point. You get up and give us seven minutes worth of information. It's kind of difficult to know exactly what the focus of your speech needs to be. I would think for that reason, this is a good example of a speech that needs a good introduction from the Toastmaster or from the person introducing you. It, that's something we forget about after listening to Dave's speech about the power of an introduction. We hear speeches 1 through 10 in the competent communicator in every meeting. We know what those are. When we get into the advanced speeches, sometimes it helps the audience to have a good setup. What are we hearing? Is this a speech to persuade? A speech to inform. It's always up to the speaker to take the initiative to go to the Toastmaster and make sure that that happens. That's not something we normally do in every meeting. However, I think that really would have helped in this particular instance to, to know up front this is not a speech to persuade but to inform. Speaking of informing, I thought you did incredibly an incredibly thorough job in research for a relatively short speech. Not only the material that we received by handout, the statistics, but the biblical passages. It was a little bit harder for me to track with you when you went over into scripture because all of a sudden I didn't have a reference in front of me or on the screen. If you had, if it had been a persuasive speech, it would have been pretty difficult to get, get all of the audience to the same point. However, I understand this, the purpose to inform. Again, good information, good eye contact, 
even though you relied on notes for some parts of it, very clear, good vocal variety, variety and all those other things. I look forward to future speeches. And I'm generally evaluated. Thank you, distinguished Toastmaster Philip Borden. I'll bring up our grammarian in just a moment, but we've had a Toastmaster who's expressed that he would like to take the initiative to help us with our impromptu speaking since we had such well-researched and rehearsed speeches today. We're going to do one or two table topics that David Vrundy has agreed to lead for us. David. Rudney, sorry. An opportunity to speak on our feet rather than on our seat. And I see another guest has joined us, Gloria Bastidas. Let's give her a round of applause in the back, a former Toastmaster. The first question is, of the speeches you've heard today, tell us something about the speeches that has affected your life or something you'd just like to share with us. And I will call on our guest, Dr. Jerry Sherman. The word ought, um, it, it really hasn't affected my life, but I thought that something was missing in terms of ought. And that is, uh, ought really means expression. And that did not come out. And the, uh, I think that that's very important. No matter what you talk about or not, it's a matter of expression. It could be self-expression. It could be expression of an audience. Uh, it could be a reaction to something that expresses something. And that would be one aspect. And, and the other, in the term of initiative, initiative is start. And that mention of start didn't come until the exploration down below. I think initiate is to start something. It is not the power of to do anything. It's just start. If you can start, then there's a hope of other things adding to that start to accomplish the power and the functions that were outlined. Both presentations were great. Uh, very little changes my life at my age. But uh, I appreciated uh, what was said and learned a great deal in all presentations. But th those two suggestions I would make, that would be uh, uh, recognizing that the salient aspect of art is expression and that initiative is a start. It may be a negative start. It needn't be positive. Thank you. Here, Jerry, I'll shake your hand. Wow, and Dr. Sherman, what a legend he is. He served in World War II. He taught at UMS for 35 years. He pioneered the freezing of sperm. I introduced him to Dr. Bates, who I hadn't seen in I don't know how long, but we, they hugged. We're all going to get together for lunch. He's an amazing person, does water aerobics, all sorts of other things. Amazing person, incredible. The last table topic question. Tell us about a public health issue that you care about. And we'll call on our guest, Gloria Bastidas. A former member, a wonderful person. Come on down. You're the next contestant. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I will start to say it is my honor to be here. Um, it's like a, when you are leaving your family and you're coming back. You are my family, many of you, for many, many months. I decide to um, not come back on a regular basis just because my schedule. That one is the only thing. But today, um, Dave asked me all of us a question, 
and I will try to remember the steps that I learned here in Toastmasters. And I'm going to start with, what do you know about cancer? Can everybody tell me anything? Cancer? Well, it kills a lot of people. Uh-huh. The, <coughs> I'm sorry. Right. So two months ago, I have the honor, the opportunity to join one of the best programs in the Arkansas Department of Health. One of them, we had too many here, and all are important. That because I'm working there, I say, this is very important. This is super important. Not because, it's because about I'm um, passionate about my work, and that one is whatever happened. This month is the uh, cancer and this awareness, and sometimes, especially for men, we think, oh, you know, um, I'm talking about my husband, we think it's just women, you know, something about women. Well, it's about all of us. It is about um, men, women, children, and because for this particular time, we and the promotion that I have today is most about breast care, cervical care, collateral um, care. It's a short message, it's screen. It's screening are very, very important. We, many of us, or maybe all of us that we are here, we have insurance. And that one is, is great. But there are too many outside that they don't have insurance. Our uh, Department of Health, they have uh, one very important program that is called breast care. I am one of them. And that information is available for all people in Arkansas. They can um, sign, they can have uh, one uh, mammogram and a lot of things. I, I don't have the whole detail here, but you can join us. You can check the Facebook uh, Breast Care, Arkansas Breast Care, and you will find more information. If you need something right now, I have my our office, the breast care office is just one more door. I can bring you some brochures. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Gloria. Gloria. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Didn't our guests do a great job? Wow, we're kind of behind on schedule, but that's okay. Let's return control to our Toastmaster, John and Jacobs. Toastmaster Rodney. Now we'll go ahead and get to our grammarian. Can we please welcome Victoria Russell back up? Tell us how we did with our speech and our use of the word initiative. Hello, Toastmasters and fellow guests. So the use of the word of that day, initiative. Jana, two, twice. Jerome, three times. Lucy, once. Leonard, once. Shauna, once. Philip, once. And I guess Dr. Sherman, four times. Um, I also just want to point out some great transition words that was used by David. More over and finally, you did a great job with your use of transition words. Um, Joyce, great job with your um, few words that I pointed out was emphasize, compelling, implies. Um, and Shauna, how you described the evaluation portion for um, the presentation, Art and Public Health as Therapy. So that concludes my grammarian report. Toastmaster John the Thank you, Toastmaster Russell. Boy, Charlie is just chomping at the bit back there to ring that bell. Let's see how we did with our ums, ahs, so's, and buts. I tried to take the initiative today <laughs> to really help us be mindful of the crutch words. 
We did good with O, but so ate us up. <laughs> There's a word that I'm going to ask to help us better understand, and that's the word and. We can use and in a sentence, but when we use and in the very beginning to start the transition to a sentence, that would be considered a crush word, correct, or any other there were a lot of ands starting the sentence, and I didn't necessarily ding those, but we still have to be mindful of the ands. I'm not going to count. If you heard the ding, you already know. Love comes back. And now for our timers report, please help me welcome Toastmaster Brandy Roberts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is that a crush word? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. For our timers report today, I did the times for our speakers, our table topics, and our evaluations today. Speaker number one, five to seven minute speech. Dave, your speech came in in six minutes and 40 seconds. Great job on that. Lucy, your speech was five to seven minutes. You came in at seven minutes and 16 seconds. Great job. Now, Joyce, on the other hand, your speech was six to eight minutes. You came in at 9.33 for your speech. So a little bit over, but good job. Great speech. You had a lot of, you had a loaded presentation, in, you know, presentation today, so. And for our table topics, for our two guests, Dr. Jerry, a minute and 33 seconds, and Ms. Gloria, three minutes and 50 seconds. She had her cancer spill. For our evaluation speeches, first person, was that you, Dr. McCoss? Yeah. Okay. Two minutes and 33 seconds. Shauna, yours came in at two minutes and 52 seconds. And Philip, your speech came in at three minutes and 27 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, Toastmaster Roberts. As a general evaluation of our meeting, we started one minute late. Overall, I thought this was a great meeting. I was so impressed with the research and the preparation that went into our plan, our scheduled speeches. Thank you to Dr. Nagunde for stepping up to the plate and taking the initiative to do a new role for him as Toastmaster and to all of our new Toastmasters who have been so flexible and eager to participate. It really helps keep our club going and gaining the reputation as being a fun place to be on a Monday morning or Monday afternoon, depending on what time we start. Of course, it is my job to provide some criticism, so I would say work on trying not to read so much from your notes and engaging more with the audience with eye contact and work on your timing so that you're not going over time. Your speeches are so good they, you don't want to get excluded because you went over on time. So I would say work on those. I have another note here that I can barely read my own handwriting. But I believe it was something to the effect of when the gavel sounds, it's time for our Toastmasters meeting. Let's try to be here early enough if we have presentations or handouts that we want to make so that when the gavel sounds, we can all be focused on our speakers and our agenda. And that's my ev general evaluation. I believe we've already met our two guests by way of David's table topics. So thank you for coming and welcome and welcome back. And I'll go ahead and end today's meeting right on time at one o'clock. Thank you, Toastmasters.